Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Bending Brains Podcast. I'm your host, Ben Arwellis. And today we have a very special guest who is going to be doing a Zoom meeting. So before she comes on air, um, Dr. Heather Maliuk, I'd like to talk about the artwork here that we have on display. Uh, my good friend, Charlie Lunsford, made these. He runs uh, Custom Craft Design, and you can find him on Instagram and Facebook. Um, his, I believe his name would be Custom underscore craft underscore design. He does a lot of things. Screen printing um, is one of his major things he does. So please reach out to Charlie Lunsford on Facebook or Instagram if you're interested in having any work done. Check out his work, like, subscribe, share. He's a great artist and a talented person. And you will see his artwork displayed for the rest of this podcast. And uh, up next, I bring you Dr. Heather Meliuk. All right, Heather, how are you? Good, Ben. How are you? Um, I'm doing okay. We, we briefly spoke about how we're doing before the podcast began. And uh, I'm doing well. I know you just spoke about everything that's going on in the music in, in industry due to COVID, mm-hmm. yeah. which is terrifying. But yeah, I think I think musicians, artists, and creatives will find a way. We'll find a way. I agree, hundred <laughs> percent. We always do. Yes, we do. Um, so for everyone listening, we are here with Dr. Heather Maliuk, an audiologist who I've known for almost eight years, mm-hmm. um, going to Sensophonics in Chicago to get ear uh, custom earplugs, ear uh, earphones made which I have here still, seven and a half years later. Nice. So thank you for that. It's You've saved my hearing 100%. Um, I've gone and got many uh, tests done, and it, nothing's really changed in seven and a half years of overly listening to music, playing music. So thank you for that. And you've probably done this for thousands of people, so thank you. Yes, thanks for saying that. It's good to, it's good to hear that, pun intended. <laughs> it's important. It's important. Um, but we'll get into that. So let's, I want to introduce you more and I want you to just kind of go over your, your, your history and your credentials, just so everyone who's listening knows, you know what you're saying and they should trust you. And this is, <laughs> it's a serious thing that everyone ignores, like everyone, yeah. even musicians. They're like, well, you know, so tell us about yourself, Heather. Sure. Well, yeah, I'm Heather Maliuk and, uh, I'm from Northeast Ohio, which is where I am currently. I'm in my, I'm in my clinic right now, my office in Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio. Um, if anyone knows of like Blossom Music Center, our big venue here, that's, I'm close to there. And, uh, I did live in Chicago for about six years, but I, I grew up as a musician and I play fiddle and guitar and um, I have a degree in music history and, and throughout college I played classical violin as well and um, have always loved music. And just to make a very long story short, I, uh, I almost became an ethnomusicologist. And when I was, had just started a master's program in ethnomusicology um, at Kent State University and I found out about audiology. And my life changed because as a musician, I honestly, I felt weird about it. I, I felt like when I, when I learned what hearing health was and how the hearing system worked, I wondered why no one had taught me about it all, all through my years of taking music lessons and then getting a degree in music and working as a professional musician. I've done everything from, you know, recording to being a street performer at Disney World to when I was in Chicago, Ben, you know, I played in a band there and I've always been involved in music and hearing's just not talked about. So I ended up getting a doctorate in audiology from Kent State University. And when someone gets a a doctoral degree in audiology, they have to do a final year of clinical placements. And part of my year was done at Sensophonics in Chicago. And Ben, I, I might have met you at like at the end of my year as a student there or something. But I did part of my year there and part at a veterans administration hospital. Um, it was just a great year. And I ended up staying on at Sensophonics and becoming the clinical director for a number of years. And then a few years ago, uh, I wanted to come home to Ohio. <laughs> and so I moved home and I started my own clinic. That was at the end of 2017. And I now run this clinic, Soundcheck Audiology and um, work full-time in the music industry. So my typical week or or month looks like um, traveling to see pro orchestras. You know, I set up backstage and I'll see 80 or 90 people in a week um, for hearing wellness visits. And I also go backstage and I work with bands. So bands who come through to Cleveland. Um, I've gone to Columbus a few times. 
you know, I mentioned Blossom here by me. In, in a typical summer, I'm usually backstage every other night seeing a band, <laughs> removing earwax, testing hearing, talking, you know, education, um, encouraging them to protect their hearing. And that's what everything was for me until COVID, of course. When the industry shut down, my clinic shut down as well because my patients weren't working anymore. And since then, I've been working in research. So I work um, with Gateway Biotechnology. Here we work out of the Northeast Ohio Medical University. And one of the things we're studying right now is the music industry and how COVID is impacting their hearing, particularly with disorders of hearing like tinnitus. Um, and so that's sort of one, one of my current, uh, a current focus of mine to get me through and pay the bills. And that's, that brings you up to date. <laughs> wow, that's, that's a lot. Well, first of all, thank you for working with all these musicians and artists and, and helping them, educating them, and educating thousands of people over the last seven years. So thank you for that. Um, I try my best, but people don't listen to someone like me. But what I do is I send them to places where people like you work. Uh, I try my best to always encourage it, to inform them. Uh, when I have friends talking about hearing damage or something's weird or they have ringing, I get, I get very freaked out. I'm like... Don't listen to anything loud. Don't don't smoke or drink. Like go see an audi audiologist like ASAP, please. That's awesome. Yeah, um, I'm probably annoying about it, but I just learned so much about it. I am not an audiologist, but between school and a proper education, and then being in this field for over ten years and being a musician, um, having those scares, going to the empty bottle and having a band too loud and I come back and things sound weird and I'm all funky and it sounds like things are out of phase, but then it fi it goes back, but it's, it scared me. And that's why I went to Sonic sense of Phonics to begin with, because I had scares like that. Yeah. It's so let's, let's break it down. Maybe a little bit why hearing conservation, hearing protection is so overlooked and so mm -hmm. misunderstood. Mm -hmm. That's wow. That's a really good question. You know, and of course, my experience is in the pro music industry, and so I can't necessarily speak for the average person down the street. Although I can, I can try to. But we know the music industry is a little different. I, I think for the general population, it's overlooked simply because audiologists and and the community that I live in, we haven't done a great job of teaching prevention. I think that a lot of uh, people associate audiologists with things like just hearing aids, mm -hmm. you know, people who fit hearing aids. And I don't think people realize that audiology is really varied and that audiologists do a lot of different things from, you know, working with patients who are dizzy to hearing loss prevention to um, working with cochlear implants and, and doing um, things during surgery. I mean, not the surgery itself, but, you know, being there and monitoring things. And mm -hmm. it, it's a really varied field. And the reason I bring that up is because I think there's a lack of awareness of, of who we are and what we do. Most of the time when I say to someone, I'm an audiologist, they don't know what that is. They've never heard of it. Now, if audiologists created a campaign of, hey, protect your hearing, and it became something normal, like how people brush their teeth. Well, why do we brush our teeth? To prevent bad things from happening in our mouths, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if we had a better campaign of here, here's how to put in an earplug, here's how to know when you need them, you know, here's the type of earplug to get, et cetera. Um, and of course, beyond earplugs, uh, conservation is about more than that. But I think for the general population, that is sort of the reason. It's just a lack of awareness. Now, the music industry is different. Um, I have seen it in my almost 10 years working in this field change really rapidly where I feel like when I first started, I would often see guys who've been in the industry for a long time sort of wearing their tinnitus as a badge uh, and almost being pr proud in a way mm -hmm. that, that they were hurting so bad. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that's true of a lot of different things in, in the music industry, even chronic pain, you know, musician injuries where people used to say, oh, of course my shoulders hurt. You know, I've been playing this instrument a long time. Mm -hmm. But now we see with the younger generations, they, they want to care for themselves, you know, and they're, they're hungry for information. And they say, well, I see the guys who've been touring for 30 years. And actually, I, I don't want to be like that. Mm -hmm. I want to be healthy. Um, and so there's, there is a big shift, I feel like, happening right now uh, in the music industry as, as people learn. But it is different. It's so funny. Sometimes when I'm working with bands and they say, well, of course, my ears ring. I'm a road dog. And I'm like, well, you know, they don't have to. And then it's usually after that conversation, after we start talking where they say, well, actually, I wish they didn't, but no one ever taught me. 
you know, yeah. 30 years ago when I started that I could protect myself. So, that's and, and one, one more thing, sorry to talk so no, much about no, this. No, no, that's, you're, that's what you're here for. One more thing is, you know, you brought up Sensophonics and the owner of Sensophonics, Mike Santucci, he's a doctor of audiology. And uh, he started the work that he does in the pro music industry in terms of hearing conservation in 1985. And when he started that, there were really only a couple other people who were working in the field of musicians hearing wellness. There's Mead Killian, who owned Edemotic Research, which is actually in Elk Grove Village. Um, And that's who makes the filters for those custom earplugs. Mm -hmm. And then Marshall Chasen up in Canada. Um, He's been working in the music industry a long time. But even still... Those are sort of the fathers of, of music audiology, the field that I work in. And, and Mike Santucci taught me a lot of what I know about protecting musicians. And um, even still, when I look at the audiology community now in 2020, there are maybe five to ten audiologists in the U.S. who sort of know music audiology and know how to work with musicians and protect them the right way. Not just musicians. I should say the live events mm-hmm. industry. You know, it's so much more than just the performers. Um, and the reason I bring that up is the education is really not there in most schools. It's not. So a, a lot of the education surrounding hearing loss prevention, there, there are pockets in terms of doctoral programs where you have experts in hearing loss prevention. And the students there are really lucky to have them. But for the most part, it's not, um, it's, it's not on the, the main uh, sort of vein of education. Mm-hmm. So, Well, I want to go back a few steps. We were talking about this information not being readily available or even promoted in our lives. Um, I know we're in the age of information, so I think you bringing up like how up-and-coming musicians and kids are more concerned and more aware, like Mm -hmm. they kind of are with everything in society and learning about ourselves, probably due to the internet and having all this information come in. Um, The old way of thinking of being like a tough guy or a tough gal, like it's okay, like I'm an artist, a musician, I'm a workhorse. This is suffering. This is pain. This is what it is. It's like when you go to the gym, you're supposed to feel bad. It's like for certain things, sure, you are supposed to train your ears and work them out, but not like that. You're not supposed to overdo Mm -hmm. it, which a lot of people do. Um, I always bring up like our hearing is not designed to hear all this 20th century reinforced amplified sound. We, we, We didn't grow for hundreds of thousands of years to develop the ability to handle these loud sounds like that. Um... And so you have to think about it. When you go outside, you don't look at the sun. You might wear sunglasses. If you're cold, you put right. on clothes. Right. If your teeth, you brush your teeth. Uh, you take care of yourself in every way. But for some reason, hearing is just overlooked. And I don't know what it is. Maybe it's because it, it doesn't shut off and it just kind of is always in the background. You, know? you hit it right on the head. I, I truly think that's what it is. I think our ears never really turn off. Mm-hmm. You know, even when we go to sleep, a sound can wake us up. Um, and of course, there, there are caveats to that. Of course, there's the deaf community and, and things. But for, for sort of like the typical person who might be listening to your podcast, if we close our eyes, we can kind of sense what it's like to be blind in a way. Mm-hmm. But our, our ears and, and hearing loss, especially from gradual, you know, loud sound exposure, you lose your hearing gradually over time. And musicians can often sort of ear train to that hearing loss until they might get some really severe side effects like pain in their ears or not being able to tell pitches apart or things like that. And often people will come to me when they get to that point um, and they just, they didn't realize it was happening. You know, yeah. and so I, I think you hit it right on the head, Ben. It's just, it, it never turns off. We don't know what it's like to have a hearing disorder or have an issue. Mm -hmm. Um, And so we, we kind of take our ears for granted. Yeah, we do. And it's, I I remember in elementary school, we'd go get a hearing test like once a year and then it kind of just like stopped and there was nothing Mm -hmm. more than that, but we're told to go to the dentist every six months, get a, get a checkup every year, um, optometrist once a year or twice a year. Why not hearing? Why shouldn't that be part of getting into high school, getting to college? It should be part of, the system, it should be what we do in our health care. Don't you agree? Yeah. Like, why is that not a thing? I mean, I agree with you. I think um, we have to get the general population to care, <laughs> I think, to make that a thing. And, you know, I, the music community, we love our hearing. I mean, we, once, someone, once, uh, once I say to a musician, here's, here's how your hearing works and here's why you should protect it. And once you lose it, it's, it's gone and the, a light bulb goes off. And, um, you know, for the, for the average 15, 16-year-old, 
if you try to talk to them about hearing, you know, it might take a little more education. Um, where we know, like with our teeth, we need them to eat, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. For musicians, we consume through our ears. Um, yeah. And so to get, to get the general population to feel the same way, uh, is, it might take a while yet. But yeah. I couldn't agree with you more. Like, perfect example. I'll just give you an example. This afternoon in my clinic, I have three kids coming in who are musicians. Not kids. They're teenagers. I shouldn't say kids. <laughs> uh, but they're coming in because their mom called me and said they're – taking music lessons they're practicing all the time and i want them to learn about how to how to be healthy musicians and i love when that happens i love when a mom calls me and says we we're trying to be educated about this and we want to get them some baseline hearing tests mm-hmm. and get them some education i mean that's really where it starts is is sort of like in the home not to of be course. corny and say no, it starts right. in the home you're but right. it, does. it does it really it does. does yeah 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 so and we, especially with kids, sorry, no, sorry, no, go, keep going. You're especially good. Especially with kids, you know, I love seeing someone young come in and learn about hearing protection, learn about proper use, and start to use it because what it does in their brain, their listening brain, it allows them to take time as they're learning music to learn hearing protection, and in a way, it creates sort of like a sense of being bilingual with music mm-hmm. where they learn to play without hearing protection and with. Because what I find is once people are working full-time as musicians, they don't have a lot of time to ear train to hearing protection. They've worked maybe 30 years with open ears. And then even if you give them the best earplug, it just doesn't, you know, it just doesn't feel right because it takes time to sort of recalibrate your brain. So it's great when it starts young because they can learn both ways. It's like speaking two languages mm. fluently. That's amazing. I, I never thought about that because I, I didn't have that growing up. But that mm-hmm. makes a lot of sense with how your brain works and how you recognize sound, uh, the dynamics of, of, of amplitude changes uh, in, within sound, and, and the frequency response of these earplugs. Mm-hmm. Um, they've gotten a lot better. Like the ones that I use from Sensophonics for the last seven and a half years are the negative 15 decibel ones, mm-hmm. which I remember you telling me to get them because they're the most flat. And you said um, as a musician – concert goer it's kind of a good middle ground and it is yeah. it's uh it's amazing but you're right the first time i put them on i had band practice that night and i wore them and where we were a loud band and it was really weird to like see the drummer hit the snare and it sounded clear but it was quiet and i didn't get that yeah i got the punch but i didn't hear the punch it was so weird yeah. and it took yeah. it took a while but now i can't I don't like playing unless I have headphones on to protect my hearing for for playing. I don't. I can't play without them. I can't go to a concert without them. I can't do anything without them. When I do construction work, I wear them, which is great because then when you want to communicate with someone you're working with, they can understand you instead of it being muffled by some earpiece. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um. Well, I guess we should go there for a little bit because, yes, musicians are exposed to a lot of loud sounds. But a lot of other people in the world are exposed to loud sounds that aren't music related. They're work related Mm -hmm. or they're uh, machines or they might be uh, some type of driver and they work in a loud truck, things like that. Um, I worked at Mm -hmm. UPS for seven years. It was very loud in those trucks, the machines. I would wear earplugs, but not all the time. I didn't learn a lot until later on. So let's talk about what, what what the everyday person who just goes to work and might be around loud things, what they should do. Because... They're people and they probably like listening to music and they probably like talking to their children. And when they're 70 and they're sitting around with their grandchildren, they probably want to be able to have conversations with them instead of sitting there going, what? And then the, you get mad because it's, way, it's the way we live and communicate with each other. It brings us together. Not being able to have that conversation with someone, even at a young age, you could see in people who are hard of hearing, it hurts them. And they might not show it, but you could see in their demeanor when they can't hear you right or they, they don't hear themselves right it's you could tell Mm -hmm. yeah it's very isolating mm -hmm. yeah yeah i think um a couple things first we're talking about sound exposure so for the for the listeners i just want to say there there are obviously more things that can cause hearing loss a lot of people think that as they age they're just automatically going to get hearing loss that's not necessarily true and of course, you, you probably have listeners who know frequency response and who, you know, if I say certain frequencies, they know what I'm talking about. Most audiologists test hearing from 250 hertz to 8,000 hertz. That's sort of like our range of where we have 
you know, whether hearing can be within normal limits or not and sort of the frequency range of a hearing aid and, and sort of how audiologists work. Within those frequencies, I really don't expect hearing loss from aging alone. Other things besides sound exposure, there's main categories of things that are certainly related to aging, like how well your blood is flowing, any genetic predisposition, certain viruses and diseases, and life-saving medications, so like chemotherapy, for example. Those, those things can affect hearing as well as sound exposure. For people who work in very noisy environments, those environments are often regulated by the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA. And if that's the case, those people will be getting an annual hearing test uh, at certain frequencies to check for noise-induced hearing loss. Um, what they're looking for are, are shifts in hearing to say whether or not the, the occupational sound has hurt their hearing. And they're provided hearing protection. And hopefully they also have a great educational portion to their hearing conservation program and they learn how to put the earplugs in properly because that's a big deal too. But for people who, you know, in every day-to-day -day life who are exposed to sound, okay, so for example, maybe you live on 10 acres and you're going to go out and be on your lawnmower for like eight hours or something like that. Um, that's an instance where you would want to wear hearing protection, okay? Or one of my favorite stories from clinic uh, is I was seeing a musician once and the, the hearing loss was more than I thought it should be. And I said, I don't understand, you know, this, this musician was really not exposed to loud, loud sound in music. Um, and we thought, and we thought for a long time and we discussed. And then this musician says to me, well, I'm, you know, I'm a blacksmith part-time. Could that do it? And so it's like, well, in that environment, you would want to wear hearing protection. So what's really great about living in 2020 is that we can take away some of the guesswork of how loud our environment is. Um, for those of you listening, if you have an Apple product, an iPhone or an iPad, there's a really great app um, that the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health put out called the NIOSH Sound Level Meter app, and it's accurate within about 2 dB, which is great. So if you're in an environment and you're thinking, is this too loud? I don't know if I'm safe here. You can take out your app and measure the sound level. If it's above 85 dBA, this is done in A weighting for those of you who are dB nerds. Um, it's done in A weighting. If it's above 85 dBA, you'll need to start considering hearing protection depending on how long you're in the environment. So the, the, the scale that the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, the safety scale that they, that they have for hearing protects about 92% of the population. And they say that 85 dB is safe for an eight hour period. And then every three dB you add to that, because three dB is a doubling of intensity of sound, every three dB you add, your safety time is cut in half. Okay, so like if you went up to 88 dB, you're safe for four hours, 91 dB is safe for two hours, et cetera. So that's a good rule of thumb. You know, I mentioned OSHA for, for people who are regulated for work. OSHA starts at 90 dB for the, like their starting level, their criterion level or, or action level. And then every five dB added on OSHA is you, you cut your safety time in half. So just to give you a, like a comparison of those, if you're standing next to an acoustic drum kit, and someone's hitting with sticks, and even if they're not heavy-handed, chances are, you know, if they're averaging about 100 dB, OSHA says you've got two hours of safety time there. NIOSH says you have 15 minutes. I would go more with the 15 minutes. Yeah, and I try, I mean, I try <laughs> to get people to follow NIOSH because, you know, it does protect 92% of the population. OSHA protects about 75%, but um, it's, it's difficult. Why, it's such difficult. A, why such a gap? That's a massive difference, an hour and 45 minutes. It is, but you know what? I... I'm really big on like education, not regulation. And I kind of love that there are two scales where we know like you can make a choice. Okay. If you want to gamble a little bit more, you can follow OSHA, maybe lose a couple, you know, hair cells, or you can go with NIOSH and be a little more protected. Did you just and use usually, hair like, cells like poker chips? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I did. Usually when I sit down with a patient and we're discussing hearing protection, I'll sort of lay out those two scales and say, you know, we can, we can try to strictly follow one. We can look at your, your length of exposure and decide what you might need in between. But my whole point in saying all of this to your listeners is sound exposure is not just about volume. Injury from sound is about volume and length of time. You can be in a loud sound. And if you're there for, you know, if you're in 85 dB for a few minutes, you're fine. Oh, yeah. 
you know? So, so it, the important point is don't just shove hearing protection in at, at, at any moment where you think something might be loud. Try to, try to be educated about it and, and not too legalistic. Right. I, I agree 100%. There's a, there's a good balance of knowing when you should wear hearing protection and knowing when you don't need to. When you're walking yeah. down the street in Chicago and the blue line L goes over your head, plug your ears for five seconds. Mm-hmm. Trust me, you'll like it a lot more. But mm-hmm. you can still walk around without earplugs. Like, it's okay. There's other loud yeah. stuff, but it's not that loud. It's the city, you know? Yeah, that's that's right. I think of the one, the track right by Cole's Bar. Yeah. It, yeah. And, that, like, I remember walking down that street and just the L going over and just totally covering my ears because it's so loud. And one thing I notice, of course, urban areas have different sound exposure than, than rural areas and that, and you have to look at your environment, what you're exposed to, because you have sort of a daily dosage, like an allowance that your ears can kind of take. Um, but I did want to bring up, it was interesting. You mentioned, you know, just walking around, you need to plug your ears. There are certain people who like the feeling of having their ears plugged and they, they really don't want to be around loud sound. And, and for someone listening, if you're, if you're someone thinking, well, I need to wear hearing protection at all times, if you get a pain response from sound and you're plugging your ears up all the time, it can worsen that. And, and I have had patients like this before where they come in for custom earplugs because they just want to wear earplugs around the city, you know, and just stay super protected. Um, but that can actually create a condition called hyperacusis mm. where you get sort of a pain response from moderately loud sounds. I think I might be so, getting there. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't say that, Ben. I'm so kidding. there is like there's a delicate there's a delicate balance. Yeah. And, and of course, people who already have hyperacusis often really want hearing protection because they don't want that pain response, and then the condition can worsen if it's not handled uh, appropriately. But that's like a different conversation. <laughs> I'm kidding, <laughs> by the way. I I have noticed though, like if I take off my headphones or my earplugs when the when my when I'm playing uh when I'm practicing with my band and mm-hmm. the drummer plays, it does sound like. It like almost hurts. It's like louder because I never do that anymore. Like yeah. spe- specific, uh, specifically like snare hits. They're just like painful if yeah. I take out my earplugs or I'm too close to it. I'm just like, oh man, you listen to that every day. You yeah, know? I know. And isn't it amazing when you do that and you realize what you used to be like sort of trained to, and maybe what your bandmates are trained to, and just how sort of malleable our hearing is. Um, and that's a really great example of people who think, oh, I can never get used to hearing protection. Well, you can. You can. You just, you honestly just are retraining your brain to a different sound. It takes some time and and dedication, but it's worth it. It's worth it to go, well, when we could go to concerts, to go to the concert and be in the front row and have your earplugs in and you still hear everything clear and you don't hurt afterwards. You don't have that headache. Your ears aren't ringing. You're not joking with your friends on the way home like, oh, my ears... Like everyone yeah. did my whole life. And now it's like, I take them out. I'm like, that was awesome. I heard everything. I felt everything. I was present. I just, my ears feel good. Like I don't, I'm not suffering. Absolutely. Yeah. And and nobody should suffer. Mm-hmm. And and there are even great over-the-counter options that, that aren't, you know, the cost of custom earplugs. And I think it's a great time for ears because we have just a ton of options now of things that can help protect us. Um, And of course, there are now new things that over the counter that can help amplify if someone has hearing loss and things like that. I mean, we've never lived in in a better time, in my opinion, um, for for hearing health. Right. And with with, let's go. I want to go a little bit into the the physiological issues with hearing loss. A lot of hearing loss can be irreversible. Yes. And what what. What are some of the, the the cases that bring to the irreversible part of it? Like what what like I've had hearing damage before, which what scared me to get sensitive earplugs, but it mm-hmm. went away after a week. It's mm-hmm. and it's slow. Every morning I woke up, it was better and better, and it just slowly went away. And then before I knew it, everything was back. Things didn't sound weird or muffled or out of phase in my ears. But yeah, and that would have been like a temporary threshold shift. Temp- that's exactly right. That's a temporary threshold shift, and. I think the easiest way to explain it is when you are, for lack of a better word, when your ears are assaulted by loud sound for a certain length of time, remember it's, it's volume and it's length of exposure. It can create a temporary threshold shift in your inner ear. So your inner ear has tens of thousands of of cells, your hair cells in, in your cochlea. The cochlea is the inner ear. When the sound is coming in and again, assaulting them, 
I think a, a really easy way to explain it is that they they swell, like the su- sort of the supporting structures can can swell and they don't move as easily. Okay, and so the lack of movement means they're not sending the neurotransmitter up your eighth cranial nerve to your brain the correct way. Okay, and so things can sound dulled because they're they're not moving as well as they used to. Um, after time, after they've had a chance to rest, that hearing can come back to quote normal. There, there's research going on right now, and it has been for for qu- quite a while at this point. But looking at the effects of a temporary threshold shift, um, we used to think that the hearing shifts, comes back to normal, everything's fine. But some researchers now are looking at what does that really do to the synapses um, that, that send signals, you know, from the inner ear to the brain. And some research is showing that even after one temporary threshold shift, you can have a, a major loss of synapses. And one of the effects of that, side effects, might be difficulty hearing speech in background noise. So the the term is cochlear synaptopathy. That's like the clinical or research term. The lay term is hidden hearing loss. And um, actually, I think it was the Chicago Tribune years ago had an article about it with an audio engineer talking about hidden hearing loss. But that's, you know, a side note. But that's what temporary threshold shift is. Okay, so that might come back to normal. Your hearing seems normal. Okay, fine. There's another type of hearing loss called a permanent threshold shift from sound exposure, okay? And that's where someone is exposed to sound. It, it injures a, a certain frequency region. Of course, I'm talking about sound exposure. I'm not talking about hearing loss from chemotherapy or you know genetics or things like that because there's a wide variety of configurations of hearing loss. But with sound exposure, a permanent threshold shift will often show up between 3,000 and 6,000 hertz um, on the hearing test, on the audiogram. One one of the reasons for that is because of the resonant properties of your ear canal, your outer ear, um, naturally amplifying that region of frequencies. And when that happens, the term permanent gives it away. That's irreversible. Uh, and that, okay, so, that happens there because our ears, sorry to cut you off, our ears no, resonate okay. at that frequency because of the shape of them. And because that's where our human speech is most uh, easy to understand, would you say? Yes. So it's interesting you brought that up. So um, depending on, you know, the listeners, depending on what you follow, you know, design or evolution, um, the ear canal has has been evolved or designed to really enhance speech frequencies, which is pretty cool when you think about it. It's amazing. Um, and, and if you look at sort of curves of, of where where we hear the best, for lack of better terminology, um, it is those sort of mids, like mid-speech frequencies where we are our most um, sensitive to sound. And then the very low frequencies and the very high frequencies, it takes more sound pressure to get us to hear, you know, the same level. Um, again, some of your listeners might be thinking of Fletcher Munson curves, equal loudness curves. Mm-hmm. Those of us who are in Music or audio engineering, we, we learn about these things and, and how the ear reacts. But yeah, it's it's so that we are really more sensitive for communication. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's why guitars, violin, cello, these things have these nice, beautiful sweet spots where you don't even have to play them that loud and you just hear them clear as day. That's where a yeah. lot of their overtones and resonant frequencies are kind of coexisting yeah. a little bit. Yeah, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah, and it's because of our our human nature. I mean, if we had a band that was made up of instruments for mice, you know, it might be in the range of like 20 to 30,000 Hertz would be like, you know, I'm just, I'm just making this up as I go, but you know, their hearing is much higher than ours. So it's, you know, and that's just our, our society has evolved sound wise to just work with our, our best ability, Mm -hmm. which is those frequencies. Yeah. I mean, even speakers and microphones are designed around these, these phenomenons that, that uh, help us hear more clearly. And that's the best part about these earplugs. Cause like when you put in the classic orange foam that everyone mm-hmm. knows about or the brown one, but they're mostly orange. Um, they hand them out at shows. Sometimes uh, a lot of construction workers will wear them. They're great. Cause they'll block, you know, 30, 35, 40 decibels. But as far as everything over well, like 800, a thousand Hertz, it's just, ooh. it starts to roll off. Yeah, lot, which you just is good. lose all the clarity. And it's fine. Like if you're working a job and you're at a piece of machinery now, sometimes you really need to be able to hear the frequency response to know if something's going on with your equipment. But if you're in a situation where you, you don't need all that high end, that's great protection. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. So for some people, it's fine. Yeah. Um, if you if you put them in the right way. Yes. A, a lot of people just leave them sort of half hanging out, and, and they really don't do much at that point. So it really sounds like at the end of the day, the, the biggest issue is just being well informed. When mm-hmm. do you use earplugs? Should you use earplugs? What kind? How to put them in? How long to leave them in for? Um, I really like that you brought up what Apple does with their hearing exposure, especially in the health mm-hmm. app with like, when I listen to music, when I go on walks, I always check on that. I keep it at a certain level. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about earbuds, like the mm-hmm. classic earbuds people put in because, because they're not blocking a lot of outside world. Like these are people yeah. tend to crank them to compensate. And now you have this diaphragm right up against your diaphragm and your, your natural diaphragm. And yeah. they're just going at it. And let's talk about, Pretty much what you said about the the Apple. Do, I wonder, does Android do that or Google? Do they have the same? I'm assuming they might these days. I don't know, to be honest, if it's if it's the same. I don't want to use the word quality because that's not what I mean. Yeah. But with Apple technology, the the device is more uniform across the spectrum. Mm-hmm. Where Android, you have especially for measuring sound around you. Android devices might all have different mic sensitivity. Mm. And so, you know, calibration is really odd then for apps that are going to be measuring the environment. In terms of measuring output of of earphones or headphones, there probably are apps that do that, but I'm not sure how reliable they are. Mm -hmm. Um, You mentioned Sensophonics earlier. Sensophonics is going to be releasing um, a new version of their DB check I don't know if you ever used that with, with any of their earphones. They, they used to have this device called DB Check that would just measure sense the phonics and sure in your monitors. But the new version is going to be able to measure almost anything so that you know, you know the output. Um, it, it measures the drive voltage. But with Apple, I know that they do have, um, with Apple Health, it'll tell you if you're listening too loudly. Mm-hmm. Um, I got that notification the other day. <laughs> I did too. On my phone. I did too. I was like, but, oh. Yeah, but and and even if you don't have that on your phone, um, there is sort of a rule of thumb with using earbuds, and and it's based on research that was done by um, two audiologists, Brian Flieger and Corey Portnuff, and it's the eighty ninety rule. And basically, uh, for earbuds, if you're going to be listening for more than ninety minutes throughout your day, uh, keep it your volume at eighty percent or less. Mm. So for ninety minutes or more throughout your day, eighty percent or less on the volume. And you're absolutely right. When you have a device that isolates you more and you don't have to deal with sort of the world around you, it affords you the opportunity to control your volume better. With something like earbuds that don't block you, you know, they're using drivers, speakers that need air. They need to be moving. And so they're they're vented so that, and, and again, there's safety issues there. It, I'm not I'm by no means saying everyone should go totally plug up their ears and go out into the world, okay? <laughs> like, it's good to be, have awareness of your environment. That's a good thing. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's much harder to control volume. So when Corey and Brian were doing their, their research on the earbuds, they found that when some people were in a, a quiet environment, so, like, for example, right now I'm alone in my office, okay? If I put on earbuds, I, I probably would listen safely. Yeah. They found that most people did listen safely, but... I think, and of course, COVID aside, typical environments where people are out and about, they're on the train, they're walking around. Um, in those environments, most people listen unsafely. As so you kind of really, have to. As you do, because yeah. it's exactly what you said. You have to increase the volume to get over your noise floor. Audiologists call it signal to noise ratio. Mm-hmm. You know, And you have to be at least 6 dB higher than the noise around you in order to hear you know, clearly and properly. Right. right. It happens so. when you're hanging out with your friends and everyone's talking and all of a sudden you get louder and louder. Yeah. Before you know it, we're like, why are we yelling at each other? Because there's 10 people <laughs> trying to get over each other because nothing's blocking that sound from getting in. Um, yeah. it's, it's a crude analogy, but it, it, that's pretty much what's going on. And um, it happens, you know, when you're at a party and you got to keep turning up the music. Well, when we used to have mm-hmm. the parties, turn up mm-hmm. music louder and louder, compensate for this crowd that's going on. So yeah. well, it's, it's so unrealistic I wish it wasn't to suggest people get big over the ear headphones or noise canceling headphones or custom, you know, a couple mm-hmm. hundred dollar earplugs. Mm-hmm. I would say if you are in the music industry, if you are an avid music player, or you you go to shows all the time, you you work with music, you're an engineer, 
I would personally recommend that you spend the three, four hundred dollars to get these headphones and these earplugs because mm-hmm. if you take care of them, like I have been, I've worn these for about eight years, the headphones and these headphones, or the earplugs mm-hmm. and these headphones, they work fine. I take care of them. Yeah. My hearing's great. I've been tested. That's my experience, but I would say that's probably the best bet for someone who's heavily involved in music, heavily yeah. listening to music every day, editing it, having to learn how to pick apart stuff. When you have certain hearing damage, listening to a mix and learning how to pick apart the frequencies and knowing when to equalize something, that can get, that can go south real fast if you have hearing damage. So you never want to get to that place. Um, yeah. What would you say is a good middle ground if you can't afford the expensive over-the-ear headphones and the expensive custom earplugs? To be honest, I think just go and get an annual hearing test. Mm-hmm. I think that's the perfect starting point. And of course, there are over-the-counter earplugs that are really nice, like the Edemotic ER20s. Mm-hmm. You know, they're about 20 bucks, and they sound so much better than foam. And for people who are going out to shows or, you know, playing with their band and they, they want anywhere between 12 to 20 dB protection, it depends on how they fit you, how deep you put them, et cetera. Mm-hmm. That's a nice starting point. But I think a lot of people make the mistake of hopping online, getting a pair of earplugs, and then saying, okay, I'm good. But actually, that's not really what hearing conservation is about. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's part of it. The, the products are really only a small percentage. Um, it's really about the education and the annual care. Mm-hmm. If you don't check your hearing every year, how do you know you're doing the right thing or not? Mm-hmm. That's I true. mean, yeah. there, there are some people who might go and get a test and wait 10 years, they get another test and they didn't realize they weren't protecting properly. You know, the best thing for me is, is the people who see me every year when they come through on tour and I test their hearing and it has not changed. And we can look from test to test to test and see that their hearing has remained stable. I mean, that is the, that's the ultimate goal. Yeah. Um, and so just, just to throw that out there, yeah, earplugs are, are great. They're going to help protect you. It's very practical to have a nice pair of earplugs and headphones or custom in-ears or whatever you're using, monitoring your levels. Um, But the hearing test and the proper education, that's everything. Yeah, that is. I mean, that is true for all different medical backgrounds. Mm -hmm. You can brush your teeth every single day. But if you don't go to the dentist, you know exactly what's going on. How do you gauge your progress? Are you doing it well? Are you doing it right? They're always going to tell you. Um, Same thing with your health, your doctor. You can work out every day and eat well, but what if certain levels in your blood are off? You don't even know. Um, I'm I'm guilty of that, by the way. I need to go to the doctor so bad. I mean, you know, we're all human. And that's why I say to people, you know, every year or two for a hearing test, one of my favorite analogies that I always tell patients or, or people who say to me, I'm thinking about coming in. What do you think? You know, should I come in? Imagine as as a musician or an audio engineer or, or whatever. Imagine you're given a piece of equipment or or an instrument when you're a kid, and and it's invisible. You can't see it. You're learning how to play it, but you can't see it, and so you don't know if it's getting hurt. You think you're taking care of it properly. Like if I had an invisible fiddle and I played it, but I couldn't see it. But what if there was a another person who could see it, which would be the audiologist in this case? Wouldn't I want to go every year and just check in and say? Yeah. Am I caring for this properly? Can you just confirm with me, make sure everything's fine um, before anything really bad happens? So that's, you know, that's always the analogy my brain goes to. It's like an invisible instrument and the person who can interpret it and see it is the audiologist. Yeah. It's, it's so funny how humans were so stubborn about our eyes, our teeth, our hearing. We're just like, ah, I'll get to it. I'll get to it. It's fine. You just keep, keep procrastinating. Um, yeah. everyone's guilty of it. I sure, I certainly am, but I will say I'm going to try my best to not do that anymore. And when I would go, when I went to you the first time and then, you know, three, four, five years later, bringing in different people and I got my hearing test and it was the same or about the same. I was like, yeah, these earplugs and the education when I'm around yeah. stuff, if I'm walking down the street in Chicago and the L goes around, I just put my fingers right on my ears just for five seconds. Just the little things I do, they add up. Uh, oh yeah. They accumulate to something more. And when you go to your concerts, putting in earplugs, um, n- getting the test every year, these things accumulate and you could better gauge what you're doing right and wrong. You're absolutely correct about that. Um, what would you suggest for musicians that are trying to make the transition or should they between the stage monitors and in-ear monitors? 
Um, what are mm. the pros and cons of those things? I know you have a lot of experience with that. Yes, I do have a lot of experience. I think, um, wow, I have, I have so many thoughts right now. I think one of the true issues, a huge disservice that's been done to the music industry as a whole is the false marketing of safety, the false promise of safety from in-ear monitors. Many in-ear monitor manufacturers will say this is a safer option for your hearing. It's simply not true. Like just at face value, that's not true. It's, it's a lie <laughs> that's put out there to the music industry. Now, if they're fit the right way, they isolate you the right way and you use them the right way, then they might be safer for your hearing. There was a study done years ago. I, I think it was done in 2008. The author was um, Jeremy Fetterman. And there was a research study done looking at in-ear monitors versus wedge monitors. And with wedge monitors, um, what he did was he took 15 different artists and measured the dBSPL level at the eardrum. Um, so he took a probe, probe microphone, put it down the ear canal. And for the artists, he took three trials with the wedge monitors and said, you know, put these where you're comfortable. We'll, we'll call it like your... your Preferred listening level, I think is what the paper called it. And they did three trials and, you know, averaged them out. It was about 110 dB, which we know on stage with a band with wedges and drums. I mean, I, I certainly have been there. It's loud. It's not surprising that it's 110 dB. You have to be able to hear to, to play clearly or to play well. And um, the, the interesting thing was that the, the second half of that part of the study, the preferred listening level within your monitors, he said, turn these, you know, where, where you're comfortable playing. It was 110 dB. It wasn't any different. And, and I see this time and time again with the music industry is they say, oh, no, man, I'm good. I've got my in-ears. But then if you actually read off, like I mentioned, the drive voltage and see where they're at, they're, they're very unsafe. Now, here's the important part. The second half of um, the Fetterman study. When he looked at the wedge monitors and said to the artists, turn these down as, as much as you can, but still play comfortably, they, they did not even turn them down 2 dB. Oh, my goodness. But with the in-ear monitors, when he said do that, and let's measure again, the average reduction in intensity was 6 dB. That's huge. And it's huge. And some people in the study went down as far as 12 dB. Uh, but the average was six. So if you, if you think back to those safety scales, the NIOSH safety scale that said every three dB, you know, you cut your time in half. Well, if you've, if you've taken away six dB from your level, you can be there so much longer, mm -hmm. you know, and be safe. So, so that's a, a part that I always try to bring up is in-ear monitors can be great for, you know, reducing how much gear you have to take on tour or take to a gig. And for a lot of people, they're more comfortable. They can help reduce volume for the audience even because the the PA is not uh competing with you know the wedge monitors it also takes away competitive monitoring mm -hmm. you know where with wedges one person goes up the other person has to go up and suddenly it's a volume war uh with in-ear monitors they do afford you the opportunity to be safe with your hearing now I mentioned isolation and, and different things of course I was trained at Sensophonics that is a silicone in-ear monitor manufacturer and the inventor of the silicone in your monitor, Chris Miskowitz, runs the lab there. And uh, so I was, you know, taught that silicone is best. I still believe that. And here's why. Between a hard material, like an acrylic or plastic earpiece versus a soft silicone earpiece, the silicone will isolate you more. Mm -hmm. So they have a noise reduction rating of 29 dB. But if you look at the frequency response, I mean, it can be anywhere from like 30 to 45 dB reduction across mm -hmm. the spectrum. Okay, so why is that important? If you are in an arena playing a gig and there are, you know, 20,000 women screaming at you and it's 110 dB just from Wait, the audience. what about me? What if I'm screaming at Taylor Swift? Well, you, you know? could, yeah, you could be screaming too. I always <laughs> just picture like teenage girls, but you could be screaming you're, too. You're not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but when you're, when you're bombarded with that sound, you need a lot of reduction. Now, if you are an audiophile, Sitting at home in your basement, just listening to, you know, $5,000 in your monitors, you probably don't need 30 to 40 dB reduction. You know, you can, you can get away with a lot less and still control your volume. Mm -hmm. So it depends on your environment. And the reason why I bring this up and I'm, I'm more flexible now about it, now that I don't, I mean, I don't work for a manufacturer anymore. Um, I'm actually starting a research study on this. Oh, wow. So uh, a, a professor at the University of Akron and I, we got a grant to study in-ear monitor isolation. 
So That's pretty amazing. soon you will see a paper coming out looking at the output of different in-ear monitor manufacturers, what they claim for isolation, and what we're actually getting from the devices. And I hope what the, the, the point of this study is not to say one manufacturer is better than the other by any means. It's for someone to look at it and say, well, here's the environment I'm in. I'm not on an arena stage. You know, maybe I'm playing a, a local folk music, hardly amplified gig at a coffee shop, and I don't need 40 dB reduction. I can get away with 15 or 20. Or for the people who are saying, well, I'm, I'm under the stage every night in arenas. I'm part of the crew, and my ears are just really taking a beating. Then they know, here's who you can go to for the 30 to 40 dB reduction. So it's a very long answer for you, Ben. No, it's okay. But that's, <laughs> this is very I love in-ear monitors. That's sort of the the quick and dirty on them. No, that's great. This is wonderful for, for every type of person who needs to hear the spectrum of how to help your ears from someone who just listens to music and lives life and does everyday normal things to someone who is an exceptional musician who tours the world and plays theaters or stadiums or what have yeah. you. Um, so pretty much the same thing with in-ear monitors like it is with headphones and, and earplugs is the education of it. It can be better for you. You said possibly and might and maybe a few times when talking about it because you're referring yes. to if you don't use it properly, like anything, it doesn't help you. If you don't wear your safety goggles, right, and you get metal splinters or wood chips in your, it's because you weren't wearing them properly. You know, That's these, right. it, it goes across every type of safety regulation. So in-ear monitors can be safer for you if you use them properly and you learn how to train your ears to turn them down a little bit because you have that protection from the outside world um, instead yeah. of having to blast them to compensate with how you normally would have heard the monitors mm -hmm. in that space. Mm -hmm. That's that's really helpful because I've never wore custom in-ear monitors mm -hmm. before, so I, I don't know much about that. Yeah, and I, I will say um, it's a weird situation in the world with in-ear monitors because the typical model is that someone goes online, they pick out in-ear monitors that maybe got advertised to them or their bandmates have them or they got an endorsement deal. You know, that's, that's very common too. They pick them out and then they call an audiologist and they say, I need, I need molds done. You know, that's always the thing. I need molds. I hate the term molds. They're ear, I call them ear impressions. I don't call them molds. Um, but they call the audiologist... And they say, I need molds done. And the audiologist schedules them for a 15-minute appointment to come in. And they take molds and they send them on their way. And that's usually what happens. Now, that is not, that has nothing to do with health. That is simply just shoving putty in someone's ear, sending them on their way. So the reason I bring this up is, it, in most cases, unless they're seeing one of the five to ten music audiologists that exists, um, they will need to go to the audiologist and when they call, say, I need ear impressions done for in-ear monitors. I would like to have a hearing test done. And then it will often be up to the, uh, to the musician to educate themselves. And most audiologists would not be able to tell someone how to be safe with in-ear monitors. And it's not their fault. It's not taught in school. I mean, it's not something that's on most people's radar. Right. And certainly there are audiologists out there who take a lot of ear impressions for in-ear monitors, but when asked about safety, they, they might not know. So, so that's so important for the musician or the audio engineer or the crew, the tech, whatever, to know going in, when you call the audiologist, please request a hearing test mm -hmm. and maybe some education if they can give you some. Earlier this year, I think it was released in January. Um, se several of us music audiologists, Michael Santucci, myself, Lisa Tannenbaum, who's an audiologist out in California, Corey Portnuff, Brian Flieger, people I've mentioned throughout this, Marshall Chasen, we put together a best practices document for the mm -hmm. audiology community. So something they can print out and have in their clinic that says when someone from the music industry comes in to see you, Here's what you do mm -hmm. if you want to, you know, be a great audiologist. It's not, it's not a requirement. It's guidelines, but they exist. So the reason I bring this up is in case there's an audiologist listening to this, there are guidelines now. Or a musician can say, hey, I'd love to look up these guidelines and make sure I have the appropriate kind of appointment for, for me and my sound exposure. Okay. That's, that's amazing. Um, with, this, with documents like that, do you have any suggestions 
to give to any type of educator or professor teaching in the music and audio world when they're informing their kids on that one week they talk about hearing, you know, in class, yeah. like things to give to them, documents, a PDF, a YouTube video, something like that. Yeah, that certainly that document is great. It might be a little bit over their head to, yeah, a little, maybe a little too like clinical audiology focused to make sense. Right. Um, I did create a video curriculum that's online that um, I do subscriptions for schools of music, audio engineering schools. I've had some orchestras get subscriptions and then for individual people as well. And it's a nine module video series that goes over everything a music industry professional needs to know about their hearing. It's about, it lasts about an hour and a half, the nine modules. And it goes over ear anatomy, physiology, basically how to see an audiologist, what to do in the appointment. Uh, it goes over selecting earplugs, how to measure sound, how to use in-ear monitors safely, et cetera, et cetera. And so that is, you know, if someone were listening to this saying, well, how would I teach my class or how would I do this and that? that, that that's why I created that. That's amazing. So there's a, What's a good it called solution. Again? Um, I, it's just on my website which is soundcheckaudiology.com, and it's the, the headline is curriculum. Um, and I know that, Ben, you and I had discussed an offering to your listeners. Mm -hmm. um, typically, for an individual who's subscribing, they get a year subscription, so they can watch it whenever they want over the course of a year um, for $195. But I know if someone emails me and they say that they learned about it on the podcast here, they learned about it listening to this podcast, they can have it for 100 Thank you so much. That's, like, That's yeah, amazing. Yeah. So I'm no gonna problem. I'm gonna I want you to say that again. Go to I'm gonna go you. to yep, soundcheckaudiology.com slash curriculum. And on there you'll see the description and my email address, which is Heather at soundcheckaudiology.com. Email me and say that you want a subscription to the curriculum and you learned about it on Ben's podcast, and you can have it for a hundred dollars. That's amazing. Thank you for doing that, and I hope yes listeners take advantage of that i will definitely promote that more um we we have a couple minutes left i just wanted to go over a couple more things um i'm trying to think here where was i oh i wanted to talk about hearing loss with age and the misconceptions um mm -hmm. most of hearing loss with age has to do with noise induced loud noises over your lifetime would you say like that's kind of what not really health like when people think, um, when people think of it, they think that it's like, oh, I, it's not because I'm old. It's because, or it is because I'm old, not because of what I did throughout my life. Yeah. Most people think that, okay, I'm old. I'm going to lose my hearing. That's yeah. just what happens. That's what I was trying to say. And I just didn't say Yeah. Well. Yeah. And, and certainly there are aspects of aging that come into play specifically with issues with blood flow and genetic predisposition to things that can create hearing loss over time. Sound is also one. Um, so sound exposure, but I, you know, I think of like the average non-musician who I see in clinic and things that, that might have contributed to their hearing loss. It's, it's not just sound exposure. Right. Overall health is so important for your hearing, especially your really high frequency hearing. So for example, smokers are more likely to have hearing loss than non-smokers because of, of how it, uh, affects the, the vascular system. You know, we, we need blood flow in our body. We need it to be working appropriately to, to give nutrients to our inner ear. When, when there are things that affect your overall health, you starve your ear of mm. its food. And so there can be issues from that as well. So just to be clear, and I mentioned these other causes of hearing loss earlier, but it's often a variety of things. And, and as we age, you know, things happen. And, and really high frequencies of hearing above 8,000 hertz those tend to decline with every decade of life anyway because of changes in our body. But certainly the hearing loss there can be exacerbated by things like sound exposure and, and blood flow and, and genetics. So overall, you can't do anything about your genetics. That is what it is. You can do a lot about how much sound exposure you have over your yep. life. Yep. And you can do a lot about smoking, drinking, drugs, uh, not being healthy, the wrong food. So your overall physical health reflects on your hearing in some way, shape, yeah. or form, no matter what. Yeah, that's right. I mean, things like, I mean, aerobic exercise, 
there, you know, there are little things that are good for so many parts of your body, but your ears as well. Now don't blast your headphones while you're exercising. (laughs) You know, you don't want to do that. There, there were a few studies done a few years ago looking at if ears were more vulnerable to sound exposure while exercising because of blood flow going from the ears Mm. to the heart and the muscles and things like that. So, so just take care, you know, in those situations. But I always say, you know, things in moderation, you know, I, I think if a listener is listening to this and they're thinking, oh my gosh, I can't smoke anymore and I can't drink anymore. Heather's no fun. She won't let me do anything. You know, that's not the case. Certainly it's more just caring for your body, being aware of your body and, and educating yourself um, and then making decisions. You know, like if you want to smoke a lot and you want to potentially sacrifice your hearing, you're free to do that. You know, as long as you know the risks. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I love the way you say that. You're saying that with, you're such a doctor. You're just like, you could do it, but you probably shouldn't. <laughs> but like, you're smiling like, yeah, yeah, do what you, be freedom of expression. Well, it's just, you know, it's just, honestly, and it's the same with sound exposure. And that's why I love education so much. I would never just like walk into a venue and say, you have to make everyone wear earplugs and it has to be quiet. And, you know, I think people should be free, but educated. If yeah. you want to go blast your ears and potentially have horrible disorders. If you're aware of that, I I don't want to regulate you not to do it, but I'm going to educate the heck out of you. Yes. I I love it. Educate the heck out of someone. I, I, I feel you in a different way. I try my best. (laughs) Um, I'm very, very particular about it. I think I annoy everyone around me, but I could sleep at night. I didn't do anything wrong by trying to help someone. Yeah. You're a hearing evangelist. (laughs) I'm trying. I just, I know the importance of communicating with a person, just just humanistic communication. Mm -hmm. When you lose the ability to hear, that changes. It doesn't go away, but it changes, and it might not be a good thing for you. Um, I know there's people who know sign language and who are deaf, and that's a whole different discussion and culture, and there's nothing wrong Mm -hmm. with that either. Mm -hmm. But as a person who grew up your whole life with hearing and you start to lose it, and I know musicians who've had hearing damage, it's very scary. It's very sad. It, um, it is. Yeah. It is for sure. And and I certainly didn't mean to make light of it. I mean, it's a terrible thing. Of course. Um, I think that's, you know, the, the fact that it all comes back to education. And what's interesting this year to me, with with people wearing face masks, I think a lot of people have realized what it's like to not be able to hear others clearly. Mm. Like I have noticed with with certain patients who have come to see me and say, I never thought I had a hearing problem till this year because I can't understand anyone at the grocery store Mm -hmm. or when I'm out and about, like I truly cannot understand people because we know masks do affect some high frequencies, some of the clarity of communication. And so it's been sort of an interesting experiment for communication this year. Mm. Um, Just, just based on that alone. So that's, you know, when we were saying earlier, ears never turn off. We don't really know what it's like to not be able to hear clearly. We have gotten some sense of that this year. That's fascinating. I, I haven't thought about it like that, and you're absolutely correct. Talking to someone with a mask, blocking all those high frequencies, yeah, not being able to hear them, it's frustrating, and you have all your hearing, and it's already frustrating. Yeah, know? and it's embarrassing to say what a lot. I mean, mm-hmm. I've been in the grocery store, and someone says something to me, and I truly cannot understand them Mm -hmm. you know and i have to ask for repetition a couple times just to to make sure i'm hearing them correctly and so it it really has been an an interesting time to see what a little bit of a change in hearing would be like Mm -hmm. that's that's so fascinating that's a great example to to end on relative to our existence right now just know if you ever want to know what it's like to not hear a person's voice well just talk with masks on and that's a good starting point it's not a good place to be um yeah in closing uh could you just one more time plug anything you want to plug are you in any any music right any bands i not at the moment moment. i've been i mean i've been busy since i moved back to ohio you know i was really focused on my business and of course i really enjoyed going to jam sessions which aren't really happening right now um but i still play music all the time just by myself um you're a phenomenal fiddle player by the way Thank you. Always have it. And guitar boy. And I still like your voice. I know you always were like, I don't know. <laughs> no, I just, you know, I'm a harmony singer and it's fine. <laughs> See? Um, 
I do. I do miss being in Glass Mountain oh. in Chicago, the band I was in, yeah. and of course, I'm still. I still talk to Sarah and Ari a lot, and I love the music scene in Chicago, and mm. I I miss it a lot. But I missed my family more, mm. uh, which is why I came home. And of course, I've got I've got eight nieces and nephews now, and most of them play music. I have a, a nephew who's a phenomenal old time harmonica player. He's seven, and he has an identical twin who's seven who's learning bagpipes. So you have a lot. Uh, just, you have a lot to do. You have a lot to take care. Oh, of. Oh yeah. A lot of education oh, yeah. in the family. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, with, uh, I think the music industry will come back and, oh, yeah. and, and of course, Soundcheck Audiology will be back up and running. And it was very interesting last fall, I started creating this online curriculum that I mentioned, not knowing what was about to happen to the world um, and not being able to travel and do lectures and things and people being able to get a subscription to this and basically have me there. Mm -hmm. one, one of the models I've been doing with schools, which has been really cool, um, is that they will get the curriculum and they'll watch it and then they'll zoom me in for either a watch party or like a question answer session mm -hmm. um, after they've seen everything. And it's been really enjoyable to be able to still educate and communicate um, really effectively in that way. I'll have to reach out to you another time to do that for my classes. That sounds, yeah, that'd be great. sounds like a great idea. Um, well, so mention your website one last time where people can go to find this, this modular sure. course. It's soundcheckaudiology.com. And I also have a Facebook page and Instagram page, which is at soundcheckaudiology. Um, and that's where I have fun. I post memes a lot about hearing <laughs> and music industry because that's just fun for me. Um, and so if anyone wants to follow me there, I'm, I try to be fairly active. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Heather. It was so Thanks nice to see you me. again, to talk to you again. It's been years. I miss the show is on your deck in Chicago. That was... Amazing. Oh, that was the best. <laughs> that was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, stay safe. Keep educating. You're doing a great thing. You've helped me. You've changed my life in how I look at sound and hearing. I'm obsessed with it now. I'm annoying to people, but that's okay. Um, I love that. Yeah. Thank you. And be safe. Keep playing music. Keep doing what you're doing. You're doing great things. And I'll be talking to you shortly. Thanks for having me, Ben. Of course. Take care. Bye.